seems to work. Okay, um, this will be a reasonably sharp presentation, and it'll just be pretty much a presentation of uh, the continuous testing that we've been doing over the last 12 months. It's been going on for more than 12 months, but I'm just going to give a 12-month snapshot of our coverage figures, the crash testing uh, trends, and our fuzzing status as well. Three areas, a few minutes in each one. So the first one is the Coverity. Uh, we run Coverity about uh, twice a week, and we get about two slots from Coverity um, per week to allow us to do that. So what I typically do is we do the first one, we find out whatever bugs are new, and then we do a sec we fix those ones pretty much there and then, and then we do another one back to back, and hopefully we get a Coverity output that's pretty close to, to zero. So we use our two slots pretty much close together like that. The results are emailed to the list. You'll see the Coverity uh, uh, summary list comes to the mailing list, the development mailing list, uh, so you can keep track of that. And obviously, um, you can go look at the actual dashboard, Coverity website itself. Uh, you don't have to be logged in uh, as a developer or anything. It's, it's public access now since we came down to small numbers. So uh, anybody who wants to read only the Coverity bugs can do so without asking for any special permission or anything like that. So. Uh, they're fully public in that sense. Um, anybody that has been a developer uh, with LibreOffice, I tend to uh, invite them to be a participant in, in Coverity. So if anybody hasn't got an invite and has any interest in fixing any of the remaining Coverity bugs and wants uh, right access to Coverity, just let me know and I'll, I'll add you to the admin list there as well. Um, on my side, I build them locally on my own hardware and then I upload to Coverity because that gives me a little bit more flexibility over what compiler I can use and what configure flags I can use. And it takes about 12 hours on the Coverity side to analyze the logs that are uploaded. Uh, they have their own compiler, they have their own uh, compiler basically that, that uh, collects all the information and then they do the analysis on their servers. That's, this is last year's numbers. So last year's numbers, we had actually, at this time last year, we had basically, but sorry, this, this is, uh, uh, yes, last year's numbers, we had gotten the, the figures down to uh, an absolute zero of, of zero outstanding defects. So just we'll compare against next year a second now, is that you'll see the 7,102 lines of code in the project that we analyzed. So what it also has to be pointed out is that to build LibreOffice, there's a whole bunch of third-party libraries as well. Uh, they're excluded from these figures on this slide. That compared to 2014 uh, of 0 0.08, and you see the kind of uh, average defect size for a project uh, of our size is that one there at the bottom of 0 0.65. So, you know, we were an order mag even at our worst in 2014, we were an order of magnitude ahead of the competition. That, that said, though, because LibreOffice is so large, I'd say a large amount of the statistics from that date effectively refer to us because we'd weigh, we'd weigh it by our own density. This year's, the number is actually back up to 0 0.02, but we have less code, so that's good too. Now, these, uh, this chart isn't the most useful chart, but it just points out that there are big spikes, big ups and big downs. This is generated from Coverity itself. And I said earlier that the previous figures excluded all the third party code that we build to get LibreOffice built itself. So this time last year, you can see that there is a, uh, that horizontal line at the very start, I've clipped it to the 12 months. The horizontal line at the very start is a, the zero defect. But when you use Coverity to chart your defects over time, it then goes back and includes all of the third party code that is excluded from the other views. So you can see that there's 1K there, so there's one, between 1 and 2,000 defects in the third party code that we build as well, which is why that line is zero from our code, but including everybody else, you get this one as well. And the reason it goes up for the first two spikes is because we build some of it against system stuff, and therefore, Coverity never sees it at all. And as time goes on, our baseline changes. And you know, if you're building on Fedora 23, and the new LibRevenge comes out, then you have to build new LibRevenge or more likely a Firebird and things like that. Which means that these figures and these charts aren't particularly useful uh, for looking at long-term trends. So for next year, we'll make things a lot easier. I'm going to build everything basically on a Docker image that always has the system libraries of the most recent requirements installed. So I'm hoping to see uh, a very straight line 
that effectively zero defects reported will be zero defects on this line. But what's interesting is the other spikes, um, where it dips down to zero for a couple of months is where my compiler goes to GCC 6, and the previous release of Coverity can't support that, so there's just that period where there's no bugs at all. It spikes up because Coverity 8.502 comes out, that has support for a whole bunch of extra warnings that I'll describe in a minute that didn't exist previously. So it's not that our defect density got suddenly worse, it's just that we discovered a whole pile of new stuff that Coverity warns about that it didn't previously. And then one just uh, kind of, um, it happens every now and then, there's like say a, a new exception is, is added to some low line code and then Coverity begins to report to us that all these places that don't allow that uh, uh, exception type in its specification, that's a fairly, regular occurrence that um, the exception specification, a small change can have a big, a big propagation, but it's temporary. So what's changed? Apparently since this time last year, we have 16,000 less lines of code in, in our project, which is, which, is, which is nice. We're now using the very latest version of Coverity. That works with GCC 6. The previous Coverity doesn't. And this now has extra warnings for C++ 11. The new warnings in Coverity is that it now knows much more about the C++11 features that it did before. So it knows about a uh, standard unique pointer. So it started complaining about cases where it believes you have let something escape from a standard unique pointer that will be destroyed before the thing that you have let it escape into. So you get some extra warnings there. It seems to have, it warns about legal address computations on things that I believe it's just wrong about, but they're all silent now as well. And it has a confusing warning about a misused comma operator, which does refer to something quite useful, uh, which I think has now been encoded into our own Clang plugins. So a useful warning, but a very confusing error message. Uh, the most uh, verbose new warning it has is missing move assignments. It has um, uh, learned about C++11 and it has now all the remaining bugs that are described at the beginning, the 0 0.02 defect density, they're all, effectively all, missing move assignments. So there's a whole, I suppose, bunch of reasons or different ways to, to solve this. You can either just ignore them, uh, you can actually write move assignment operators, or we can just adjust the code slightly so it doesn't need it doesn't warn about them because the assignment doesn't, isn't there in the first place, isn't existing. There are a couple additional new warnings for Java as well because Coverity at this point allows us to build a project that uses Java and C++ and warn for the two of them. So uh, it has a baseline of 1.7 JTK now as well. So if we are to rate a baseline, this means that this problem of, of a mixture of APIs goes away as well. That's the Coverity stuff, pretty much under control. The outstanding stuff is how to solve the last uh, remaining missing move assignments. They're only down as a low priority um, Coverity recommendation level warning. They're not very serious. We could even silence a lot of them in one fell swoop without any major issues. It's just that with Coverity, as you've seen, is that when code changes, the same old issues arise again and again because the code changes and it doesn't recognize that the previous time you dismissed it, that it's still, you still want to dismiss it. That's severity. The crash testing uh, was mentioned briefly. Thurston mentioned uh, some of the crash testing. I'll show you what crash testing looks like over the last 12 months. And there's 118 different formats supported for load in crash testing, including the ancient star office file formats that we got rid of with the binary filter. But now we have libstaroffice, so that they're actually relevant again. So all these staroffice formats, uh, that column there can be investigated for any libstaroffice crashes. So we check to see if anything crashes. We also check to see if anything asserts as well. We enable asserts. So any of the crashes you see may not actually be significant in the real world. They may just be an assert which goes on to be harmless in this particular case. We save a bunch of them. We save out about these. 12 formats here, so the exporting is much less formats than the importing, but they're the serious formats to be interested in. Again, this one is run once or twice a week, takes about two days to complete. The number of documents at this stage is up to 93,000, which is up 10,000 on last year. The documents, 90% of them come from various bugzillas, and we have a script to download from the various bugzillas, which probably means that since last year there have been 10,000 bugs logged 
with new documents attached to them in our Bugzilla, the Mozilla Bugzilla, and uh, the Red Hat one, and one or two others. The actual pilot documents that we uh, uh, test again that I described come from the Bugzillas. We, we, we don't refresh them the whole time. The actual script to download them all, to update them, just to add to what's already uh, on your disk is about 12 to 13 hours, so it's a very, very large process. Once every couple of months when there's a couple of consistent weeks in a row that there's no new crashes reported, then perhaps we, we update it. Yeah, so this is what this year's one looks. What you're just hoping for is, you know, this is basically a presentation where I try and show you a straight line and say how great it is. But uh, this shows how the whole thing works um, as a process. Nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. Um, there is a new bug introduced. You find it straight away. You fix it straight away. Nothing happens, nothing happens for months. Then there's a new feature, GSOC feature. You notice straight away that there's a crasher there, and you fix it straight away. So I, mean, I think that's as an idealist chart as you can get finds the problems, you fix the problems, and you go straight up and straight down. That's 12 months since this time last year. Only two major events and a couple of minor ones. Export failures. I went back and I checked to see what was the, the reason behind these ones. That's the um, uh, Netscape plugin API removal. It had a dramatic effect on the export of PowerPoint documents, or some kind of presentation documents anyway, where whatever property was removed caused great grief when you exported something that had previously had uh, a plugin embedded in it. So that was uh, the major one there. And then I think it was the VCL event dispatch. I'm not entirely sure. There was one spike that went away in those two or three uh, commits in that period that might have explained why it came and why it went away again. Either way, the, the good news is it got fixed pretty fast. So that's the uh, crash testing. I'll give the results for this week. Uh, there's about 40 coverage warnings. That's the uh, missing move assignment warning. About zero to one import failure, about zero to one export failure. That's pretty much par for the course. And then I'll just give you one last uh, uh, update on where we are with fuzzing. And so it's just basically to say that we are fuzzing and what it kind of looks like um, from my side for that. And the one I'm using at the moment is that American fuzzy lock. It's, it's really good. I'm a, very, I'm, a good, I'm a great fan of it. And we have a small stripped down custom file format loader called FF Tester that basically has stripped out all of the slower configuration related paths. And it supports this American fuzzy lock server mode so it can restart pretty quickly. So I can, gener uh, I can par parse you know, multiple, multiple documents in, in a tight loop. And it works pretty well for that. There's a, a, an AFLC minimizer that you run over your collection of, of files, and it tells you what is the minimum set of these files that, that exercises uh, the majority of code paths. So I can run it over, say, the doc file format and come up with the minimum set of 1,000 or 2,000 documents that exercises the most code paths. At that point, then, you need to get the smallest ones that you can, so you just take the big ones and you throw them out, and whatever's left over, you seed the process with that, and you just turn it on let it go for months on end and come back to it. Uh, there's a chart in a bit that shows what that kind of looks like. So again, this time last year, um, I was looking at the Lotus Word Pro file format, and you can see there at the very start, as soon as you turn on the uh, process, it can take you a, a you know, couple of days to get started, to get everything into the right shape, uh, set up your filters, find your minimum set of documents, and then once you turn it on, you find results basically in the first five or six minutes, the majority of them cluster there. So you can see it starts off great big excitement of fixes. Every time I find something, I do it on a, just a 24-hour basis, let it run, check it in the morning, shut it down, fix whatever bugs it finds, start it up again. So that's continuously stopping and restarting as that goes along. You get a period where nothing happens for ages, then you get another tight cluster, nothing happens, tight cluster, and so on. So I shut that down there about um, uh, July this year. I wasn't finding anything for about two months or more than two months. And I turned it on again for the RTF filter. And, and you get a much less dramatic spikes, but you get the same pattern again. You get a lot of stuff at the beginning, long pauses and, and whatever. So that's just to let you know that the fuzzing is going on. It's going on all the time in the background. And uh, it's going on right now. And that will keep going for that file format until I get another two or three months where, where nothing happens. and then we'll go back to just trying it in all formats I'm interested in and 
gives a chug away. So it continues away in the background the whole time. That's all I got. If anybody has any questions on the process, now is a good time. So, questions? Okay, thank you.